The passage we're going to focus on tonight is from Mark chapter 6, beginning at the 14th verse and going through the 29th verse. So if you're following along the scriptures, feel free to join me. Following along silently as I read Mark chapter 6, verse 14. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work within him. Others said he is Elijah. Others said he's a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John knowing that he was a righteous, holy man, and he kept him safe. And when he heard him, he was greatly perplexed. And yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' his daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guest. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And she came immediately into the house of the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. But because of his oath and his guest, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. And he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Mark chapter 6, verse 14 through 29. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Lord Jesus, we thank you uh, that we know who you are, that we know that you are our Savior, you are God, you've given your life for us and you've risen again. But Lord, may we know more about you and understand more about you as we dig deeper into this text, as those in the first century who encountered you discovered who you truly were. In Jesus' name. Amen. That text from Mark chapter 6 begins with this question, the identity of Jesus. Who is he? Some people are saying one thing, and some people are saying another. And the reason that they're asking it is because in Mark chapter 5, the preceding chapter, Jesus had raised from the dead a young girl, the daughter of one of the synagogue rulers of one of the small villages along the Sea of Galilee. His name was Jairus. And Jesus resurrected her from the dead. And then in chapter 6, Jesus continued his healing and teaching ministry. And not only did he continue, but then he also sent out his disciples, his 12, two by two. They fanned out across the countryside, going into different villages. And they were anointing the sick with oil in Jesus' name. And Jesus was healing them through their ministry. Jesus had also given them authority over evil demons to cast them out. And they did. And all of this was bringing back the report and the news so that the topic was swirling about who is this Jesus that he can do these things. And the news about it, by verse 16, had even come to the king. And so in verse 14, when our lesson starts, it says King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, he's John the Baptist raised from the dead. That's why these miraculous powers are at work within him. But others said, no, he is Elijah. And still others said, he is one of the prophets, like one of the prophets of old. The report even came to the king. Well, so-called king. Herod was never given the title of king by the Roman emperor. It was something he aspired to. The Roman emperor had commissioned and appointed him as Tetrarch of Galilee, but not King of Galilee. But it was something he was always wanting to attain. And so he considered himself king. He called himself a king. And when Mark introduces himself, him here as a king, Mark is introducing Herod Antipas because of what Herod thinks about Jesus. And then right after introducing him, 
Mark seems to digress, and the rest of the lesson, from verses 16 all the way down through 29, has seemed to be this sordid tale about what Herod did to off John the Baptist. In Mr. Holstein's classroom, in my high school days, we tended to learn more about football than we did about U.S. history, even though that was the subject of the course. Mr. Holstein had played professional football with the Detroit Lions organization. He still had a love for the sport, even years after he had become a high school teacher. So it didn't take much, just one well-placed question from our class to get him off topic. And he'd be talking about pass blocking and slant runs instead of U.S. history. And sometimes we didn't have to do anything. He would just dive into football terminology or start reliving memories from on the field. And we didn't have to prompt him at all. Now, I am going to take a risk here and trust that you're not going to do that to me. Because I want to give you a little history lesson for a moment. Are you ready for it? Some of the Jews thought that the destruction of Herod's army had come about from God, and that very justly, as a punishment for what he did against John that was called the Baptist. For Herod killed him, who was a good man, and commanded the Jews to exercise virtue, both as to righteousness towards one another and as piety towards God, and so to come to baptism. Now many others came in crowds about him, for they were very greatly moved or pleased by hearing his words. Herod, who feared, lest the great influence that John had over the people might put it into his power and inclination to raise a rebellion, for they seemed ready to do anything that he should advise, thought it best by putting him to death to prevent any mischief he might cause and not to bring himself to any difficulties by sparing a man who might otherwise make him repent of it when it would be too late. That's not from the Bible. That's about John the Baptist. It's from a first century history book. This, written at the end of the first century, commissioned by Rome, to be written by a Jew, scholar and statesman named Flavius Josephus, who was living in Rome at the time. And it was commissioned to be written 25 years after Rome had destroyed Jerusalem. Commissioned him to write it to give a history of the Jewish people and how it is that they came to be conquered by Rome. And so this book is called Jewish Antiquities. And that was from chapter 5, book 18, section 2. Paragraph 116 through 119. John the Baptist was such a significant character in first century Judaism that he was even being written about 65 years after his death. His death was being written about in Roman history books. John the Baptist was such a significant character in the first century Judaism that 65 years later, after he died, his death was being written about in Roman history books. And why? You might ask, well, you know the saying, those who do not know history are, can you finish that saying? Doomed to repeat it, exactly. But not that the Romans are concerned that somebody might repeat John's fate, but they are concerned that future rulers might repeat the fate Herod Antipas. See, John the Baptist's death is significant to Flavius Josephus as he's writing a history at the end of the first century because of the way that John's death anticipates and foreshadows the downfall of Herod himself. A Mark, when he writes his gospel, is not writing to us about Herod. He's not writing to us about John the Baptist either. He tells us what he's writing about. The very first verse, same thing the rest of the Bible is about. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so very appropriately, our text in chapter 6, verse 14, begins with this discussion about Jesus. Who is this Jesus? But then, like students who delight in getting their teacher off subject and onto some tangential story during a boring lesson, Mark leaves the topic about who Jesus is and starts down a rabbit trail about Herod's extracurricular antics. Now, he's going to come back to the topic about who Jesus is. In fact, verses 14 and 15 of this text that recite what the crowd's been saying about Jesus, well, John will Mark will repeat that almost verbatim in chapter 8, just before Jesus asks his disciples in chapter 8, verse 27, but who do you say that I am? And yet, in the meantime, it seems that Mark has gotten off topic. 
And he's gotten into this sordid and, and odd and, and really disturbing tale about what happened to John the Baptist and how Herod often tells it in more sordid detail than even Flavius Josephus cares to relate to us in his history book. Actually tells it in more detail in Mark's gospel than any other gospel writer. Now we can see why Mark might go there. It is certainly tangential to the story of Jesus. You can see how Mark got on that rabbit trail because John is related to Jesus, although Mark hasn't told us that in his gospel. And, and John is the forerunner of Jesus, the announcer of Jesus. And that's how John is introduced in Mark's gospel in chapter 1, verse 4 already because Mark doesn't include any story about Jesus' birth and instead introduces Jesus with John the Baptist coming on the scene. And so in that sense, we might see this story about John the Baptist in chapter 6 as Mark just resolving an unresolved part of the storyline that he has going so that he can continue talking about Jesus. But unless we think of Mark as just some rambling history teacher, let me remind us that this is not just the words of Mark. It's the scriptures, which means it's the word of God. That is to say, everything in it has been inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it is for us, for our faith in Jesus. And so, because of that, from the Holy Spirit's perspective, from the Lord's perspective, that is, I'd like to suggest to you that this whole story about what Herod did to John the Baptist is not just about John, and it's not just about Herod. It is key to understanding that fundamental question about who Jesus is. So permit me to explain to you. I asked you just a moment ago to finish a phrase for me. Those who do not know history are doomed to repeat it. That's right. I've got a couple more of those for you. Let's see if you can come up with them. What goes around comes around. That's right. You reap what you sow. He got what he deserved. See, you've got the idea. You're three for three. You know how this works. We all know how this works because this is the world we live in. This is this goes around, comes around idea, something that we often or many in the world would call karma. It's the idea that fate will not allow foolishness to go unanswered or an evil deed to go unrequited. And so even if you don't follow fate, but you say, I believe in God who has control over such things, well then we tend to call it something like divine retribution at work. Whatever you want to call it, it's there in Josephus. Divine retribution is what the Jews were calling it, and that's what Josephus says about why they thought Herod had such a downfall, because retribution over what he did to John the Baptist. It's there at the end of the first century, 65 years after John the Baptist's death, but I'd like to tell you, it's still there today, and I think you know that. It's in our own hearts and in our own minds. Last week I was on vacation, and so I want to thank you for that time away. And I also want to say thank you to Pastor Mark Hewitt, who is here with you on the first Sunday of July, on July 1st, sharing God's word with you. And I appreciate him coming for three services that day uh, to preach for you. And then last week, it was Pastor Ed Schultz who was with you and shared God's word in all three of our services. That first week, my family and I were in Minneapolis, where my wife's family is from. So we were worshiping at Faith Lutheran Church in Minneapolis with her parents and her sisters and their families. And then last week, we were in St. Louis, where my family's from. We were with my parents and my sister and her family. We were at our Savior Lutheran Church, Fenton, Missouri, a suburb just south of St. Louis, where I grew up. While we were there visiting, I went fishing with my dad on one morning, and we went down to the Merrimack River, which is the river that flows through the suburb of Fenton, the hometown where I grew up, and we were fishing there between the bridges. And as we were fishing that morning, it brought to mind a time when I was in, I think, early elementary school, a fishing trip I had gone on with my dad. And I believe, if I recall correctly, even on that same river, it was my dad and his good friend Stanley and I, and we were all in a boat. They on either hand, and I was in the middle. And I believe it was evening. I don't remember a whole much, a whole lot, all that much about our fishing trip that day, but there's one thing I'll never forget, and that is, at one point, I went to cast. And I don't know why, but I, I let go of the handle of my rod. And so I did cast, but I cast my rod and reel and everything right into the water. 
And then Stanley was sitting in the boat in the direction that faced me, and he watched me do it. And he said, why did you do that? And I remember what I said to him. I said, I didn't do it. <laughs> well, that's not what I meant. I, I should have said, I didn't mean to do it. But what I said was, I didn't do it. And he looked at me and he said, yes, you did. I watched you throw your pole right into the water. And that was the end of the fishing trip. We spent the rest of the night them dragging hooks across the bottom of the river, trying to catch my rod and reel. And eventually they did and were able to bring it back up. And so no harm, no damage done. And yet, they never let me forget it. So every time I went with my dad to visit his friend Stanley, Stanley would remind me of the time that I threw my pole into the water and said I didn't do it. I'd like to suggest that's what this whole idea of what goes around comes around does to you and me. It doesn't let us forget our mistakes. But like hooks on the bottom of the riverbed of our life, it just keeps dragging them up. So that when something bad happens in our life, there's always this nagging thought in the back of our head that says, oh, you must have done something wrong. You deserve this one. And even if we can't pinpoint what it is that we've done, we start running through that list of all of our regrets in life to see what it might have been that caused it. And we do this not only to ourselves, we do this to other people too. And so with their faults, faults, their missteps, their mistakes, Oh, we keep tallying those and we keep record of them just so that they might come around later. We might be able to bring them back around so this law of consequences doesn't break its cycle in their life either. And so this is why in a marriage, husband and wife might continue to bring up words, misspoken words that should have been water under the Merrimack River Bridge long, long ago. And they keep showing up in future, future arguments. And this is why siblings stop talking to each other, giving each other the silent treatment, and each one thinking that oh, this silent treatment is giving the other what they're due. Or this is, happens in the workplace, it happens in the neighborhood, it's that tit for tat between two people where each one thinks that every time they are giving the other one what they've got coming to them. Well, the reason that Mark brings this up in our text for today is because this is what Herod thinks is happening. Herod is sure what goes around was starting to come around in his life. When he hears the reports about Jesus, he thinks that John the Baptist, who he beheaded, his greatest mistake is now coming back to get him. Obviously, it had been bothering him. It had been bothering him for a long time because Herod knew from the start, before he ever imprisoned or beheaded John, there was something otherworldly about John's message. And that's why even though it says in verse 19, even though Herodias, his wife, had a grudge against John, she could not put him to death because Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man. And he kept him safe. And when he heard him, he was greatly perplexed by his words, but he heard him gladly. And yet Herodias, his wife, is a lot like Jezebel. You know, Jezebel, that evil wife of the weak-willed king Ahab back in the days of Elijah in the Old Testament. Jezebel, who was always trying to route around Ahab to get him to put Elijah to death. Herod is like Ahab. His wife is like Jezebel. John the Baptist is like Elijah. He's not only like Elijah, Mark describes him like Elijah. So in that very first chapter, when John the Baptist is introduced, in chapter 1, verse 6, he describes John as wearing a camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, the same outfit that Elijah wore in the Old Testament. Later on, Jesus, in Mark chapter 9, verse 14, is going to allude to the fact that John the Baptist is the Elijah who was to come. And not that he's Elijah himself, but he's the fulfillment of what Malachi the prophet said in the Old Testament in chapter 4, when he said that Elijah would come again before the great and awesome day of the Lord. And so Herod, like we willed Ahab, is outdone by his wife. And she gets her way. And you know how it happened. I don't have to go through all the details of the story. You've heard me read it. <laughs> Herod has a party 
for all his military officials and all the dignitaries, and he's his normal, drunken, boastful self. And he promises his stepdaughter, his wife's daughter, that he will give her anything she wants, up to half of the kingdom. Just name it, and he'll give it to her. And his wife sees the opportunity and asks for John the Baptist's head on a platter to be paraded in front of all of those honored guests. And against all of his better judgment, and in blasphemy against the Holy Spirit that had been telling him to believe in the message of John and to repent of his sins, he summons the executioner, commands him to break the head of John. Now it's interesting the word that Mark uses for executioner because Mark names him by his Latin title. Mark wrote his gospel in Greek, but the executioner's title is in Latin. And you'll like this because you'll recognize this word. Executioner in Latin is speculator. <laughs> speculator. And from that moment on, from the time he sent the speculator, Herod is speculating about this news regarding Jesus that what is this? Is it my greatest mistake, the death of John the Baptist coming back to give me? Has John the Baptist been raised from the dead? And it's not that Herod actually literally rationally thought that Jesus was physically John raised from the dead because Jesus is alive at the same time that John is alive and John has been talking about Jesus. That's been John's message. But his conscience won't let him let it go. He continues to plague him. And here is why this story is so key to the identity of who Jesus is. Because Jesus is life begins to look a lot like John the Baptist. Jesus himself now will stand trial before this very Herod. Jesus himself is going to be executed, put to death, put to death by a Roman appointed governor. And he's going to be put to death by a governor who's kind of tricked into it, who's backed into a corner. He's got no other options because he's got a safe face in front of political dignitaries, this time not those in Galilee, but those in Rome, who do not think he knows how to handle these Jewish masses in Judea. So he's backed into a corner and orders the execution of Jesus. And then Jesus' disciples come and take his body and place it into a tomb, which is the same thing that John the Baptist's disciples do in the last verse of our text, Mark chapter 6. Verse 29. Except that is the end of the story for John the Baptist. But that's not the end of the story for Jesus. Because Herod feared that John may have risen from the dead. But the truth is, John's message was never about himself. Anything he had said was actually about Jesus. Jesus is the one who rose from the dead. And that is good news and brings a good take home for you and me. Because this is what that means. Because Jesus rose from the dead, it means that what goes around does not have to come around in our life. Jesus rose from the grave, but all of our mistakes stayed there and did not rise. He walked out of the tomb, but all of our missteps, our weak will moments, our sins that were buried with him are still there. The concept is called forgiveness. It's forgiveness in Jesus. And this is what Mark's message is all about. And it's why he introduced John the Baptist to begin with, because that was John the Baptist's message from the beginning. If we go back to chapter 1, verse 4, where he introduced John the Baptist, it says that John appeared baptizing in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and Jerusalem went out to him to be baptized in the river, confessing their sins. And he preached, saying, After me is coming one, Greater than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. See, John's message was that those who believe and turn away from their sins could through baptism, initially through his baptism, but then through baptism into Jesus, experience a new mode of life. A new mode of life that is not a slave to this world's karma and what goes around comes around anymore. If they can have freedom and forgiveness and live in the grace of God. Now, King Herod feared the message of John. 
Even though he's drawn to it, he was perplexed. Ultimately, he feared it after he had put John to death because he was afraid that John the Baptist had come back from the dead in Jesus. And not that he thought that Jesus was physically John the Baptist, but, but John's words, John's message, they're there in the teaching of Jesus. And, and, and John's word is going to have the last word in my life. And he feared it. And you know what? John's word did have the last word in Herod's life. Because John's message was not about himself. It was about Jesus. And Jesus is the first and the last. Jesus had the last word, but John didn't need, Herod didn't need to fear it. Neither did the people who put Jesus to death. They didn't need to fear Jesus' word. Now, many of them did. The ones who put Jesus to death. And so when Jesus' disciples are doing their first preaching in Acts chapter 2, Pentecost day, Peter stood up and he told the crowds, let all of Israel know this for certain, that God has made both Lord and Christ, this Jesus who you crucified. And it tells us in the text that the people responded and were cut to the heart and said, brothers, what should we do? And Peter replied, and listen to this because it's so similar to John's message. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins in the name of Jesus Christ, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, all whom the Lord our God will call to himself. Through faith in Jesus, by baptism into his name, we have that forgiveness. We don't have to live in this world's cycle of what goes around and comes around anymore. But in addition to that, we can also share that forgiveness with others. We can break that cycle of what goes around comes around in somebody else's life. So I was talking just recently, a couple days ago, with a woman who was there in the last moments of her father's life. He was in his last days and she was visiting with him in the hospital room. And she had said that she and her father had not always gotten along because she was stubborn and he was ornery. They often butted heads and locked horns. And so she said in those last moments, she looked at him in the eyes and he was looking at her and she said to him, Dad, I'm sorry for all the things I said to you and everything that I did to you all those years. I hope you can forgive me. And then she added, and Dad, I forgive you too. And by this point, he was too far on that road to being with his Lord to be able to speak to her. But she said he looked deeply into her eyes and she knew he understood because tears were running down both of their faces. That is why this story is so key to the understanding of who Jesus is. Because Jesus is the only one who can provide that for us. This is who he is. And it's the story about the demise of John the Baptist in the scripture that brings that about and assures us of it. And so now that you know that little bit of history, and you know about Herod, who in his unfaithful rejection never accepted and believed that message, you're not doomed to repeat his mistake. You can live in faith. In faith 